All right, guys, we're here uh, today to talk a little bit about uh, garden cleanup. Uh, my name is Jeff Epping. I'm the director of horticulture. I'm here with Sam Malone and Katie Pratt. And um, we're going to tell you why you should be a little more lazy uh, in your gardening cleanup at the end of the at the end of the season, which is in full swing right now out in my neighborhood. Uh, everybody was was blowing leaves and, and cleaning things up in their garden. So we wanted to talk a little bit about that. So if we do, why why what do we want to do, or what don't we want to do? What don't we want to do? Um, so actually, we don't want to do much. We kind of keep to the very like minimal amount of cutting back. Uh, one of the main reasons for that is a lot of insects, uh, beneficial insects like caterpillars, moths, spiders, millipedes, you name it. it. A lot of it overwinters in our leaf matter or on some of the stems of our uh, perennial plants. So we tend to like to leave that sit all, um, all winter. You're saying there's some kind of particular moth or something? Yep, so actually two really well-known moths that overwinter in their chrysalis form in the leaf matter are the swallowtails and uh, lunar moths. So two very common, well-known moths. So, and then also woolly bears, as a caterpillar form, they overwinter underneath the leaves. So the leaves actually act as like an insulating layer um, for us. <laughs> so, yep, and so even if you like chop up some of your leaves, don't do all of them. You can definitely chop some, but leave like kind of your full, full leaf. Um, if you think about it in nature, in the woods, in the forest, all the leaves that fall from those trees, they no one's going in and mowing them up, no one's going in and raking them up, those all just lay right there. Um, and a lot of the spring ephemerals would seem like these tiny, tiny, dainty little things, even those will still come up. So it's not too much of a worry as far as suffocating any of your, your plant material. I mean, I'm always amazed by summer eagles who are working their hardly anything left mm -hmm. at this time of year in the next day. Yep, it also acts as a great nutrient for our, our plants, kind of completes that whole circle of life we've got. Yeah. So we try to leave it as natural as possible. And look at, I mean, in a garden as beautiful as this, why would you want to cut it back? I mean, it, it, it's so cool when there's snow on everything, and mm -hmm. so much of this actually stays up. Um, you know, Katie, what's next to you there? Yeah, so this is Eryngium yuccifolium, or Rattlesnake Master. So this is like a great structural presence in the winter landscape um, and it's also hollow stem so there's like 30 percent of na north american native bees that will nest in the hollow stems of plants um, so when you're done leaving this up for the winter um, for winter interest in the springtime we'll actually cut these like 18 inches from the ground and just leave the stem standing so that native bees can actually use that as a nesting habitat, which is really good for them. So we do we do cut this stuff back, right? But we wait. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So what? There's some rule of thumb or something. Yep. So typically we try to wait to cut things back until we've had five degrees or five days of 50 degree temperatures, daytime temperatures. So five days in a row, 50 degrees. That's when we'll go in and we'll cut back the things to 18 inches that are hollow stems and then we'll go through and just mow down the rest of the stuff. Because at that point a lot of our beneficial insects and bees and stuff have already hatched, come out of their hibernation for the winter so you're not just mowing them up and killing them all. So when you <laughs> mow it up, what do you do with it? We leave it. We leave it. We yeah. leave it. We so it just... makes great mulch. Mm -hmm. So you know you don't have to rake it all up, throw it to the curb, potentially you know in our lakes with it and so somebody picks it up or just you know stockpile it somewhere with all the fossil fuels that you know we used to do that so put it to good use you know mm -hmm. in again in nature in a prairie <laughs> where's all this stuff go right yep. back into the helping the plants do better in the future so um, there's no need to get rid of it that's for sure I will say there are like a select few things that we do cut back um, now for example like peonies or other plants that harbor a lot of diseases we want to get those like out of the garden right away right. or like sometimes if plants are along your edge that you're going to be you know using a snow blower and they might get tangled up we'll kind of trim those back right. um, but <clears throat> outside of that we don't do too much um, fall cleanup in the traditional sense is it is it true that most the 
best plants for the insects are the native native plants. Mm -hmm. So like peonies when they're right. hosta, they're probably mm -hmm. yep. really benefit insects much anyway. So Yep, exactly. Um Katie, what what do we got? Yeah. What what about bees? I mean what we got a lot going <laughs> in here. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention about the seed heads is these are really good food sources for a lot of our songbirds and stuff mm -hmm. too. Um, like the cone heads are used and these guys. And they'll also, if you leave them standing, they can actually just reseed in your garden and create more good plants that you don't have to buy. <laughs> right, right. So leaving seed heads are nice too. And this is this is a good example of a good way to garden. You know, we've all been taught that you got to leave, you know, 12 inches of space between every plant. That just gives space for weeds to grow, you know, to germinate and grow. Put them together close. If you go out and walk in a prairie, you never see any empty space. So um, it's easier to garden this way. And it's more beautiful. I mean, just the different textures of the grasses and everything, uh, as well as, you know, helping, helping our insects out. It's important that we have a lot of insects because that's the food source for all of our songbirds and such. Right? So, um, you know, we want to think about that uh, when, we're, when, we're, when we're gardening. gardening. We, you were talking about birds out in the gravel garden. We have uh, Coreopsis or tick seed out there and the goldfinches go crazy in there until they exhaust all the seeds uh, in early winter. So that's, that's an added bonus. You don't have to go buy seed. You have it right in your own hand. Another point about birds is like if you do leave a lot of this um, your perennial matter standing all winter, it actually adds like a little shelter for birds as they're kind of flying around if they need to escape or uh, get away from the elements and stuff. It actually provides perfect little hideaways for them. Mm -hmm. And all of this um, grass material is good nesting, yeah. uh, you know, for them nesting material for them to create their nests in the springtime too. It's just there waiting for them. And a lot of that material you make like special houses for insects too, right? Yes, so maybe we could show that as well. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of hollow stem material that you can use. <laughs> Cold! Um, this is a project that we started last fall, and it was um, partially funded by the Dane County Environmental Council through a grant that we applied for. Um, but basically here we're providing uh, educational opportunity and um, additional habitat nesting for native bees. So each one of these little compartments has hollow stems for native bees. And you can see there's a lot of different diameters. So some bees are really, really tiny and some are like this big. <laughs> so this will be used by mason bees, leaf cutter bees, um, masked bees, lots of different bees. <laughs> um, and they're all native, which is important too. Um, they're not just like your typical European honeybee that needs a hive to live in. And there's something like, am I exaggerating, like 400 species or something like that? Yeah, there's 400 different native species in Wisconsin. And what do you hear about like two? Yeah exactly. It's amazing. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so each of the bee species will um, start in the very back of the tunnel, lay an egg, put a pollen sac, and create these little cavities all the way out of the tube. And then you can tell if they're being used because they have this little like end uh, point where they're filling it with sand or leaves or whatever nesting material that they use. Um, so you can see if you come really close, <laughs> a couple of these are actually filled already, which I think is super cool. So there's little little bee eggs overwintering in there. Oh man, they're like completely filled up in those. Mm -hmm. And even just this like little tiny one. Yeah. There's also resin bees, so they'll use like plant saps and resins super cool and what's cool is it's all free it's all, all that stuff's in your garden and mm -hmm. we put them together what in winter or early spring when mm -hmm. you when you're itching to get out in the garden anyway so you can kind of put those together i have a couple small ones at home that i made i have some scrap wood and stuff it's not it doesn't take much mm -hmm. in fact it doesn't have to be huge and big um right you know right it's yeah the smaller the better because mm -hmm. all of these bees are also solitary nesting 
So they, they don't nest in a big hive, so they're really solitary and docile and like super calm bees, so they're not going to come out and attack you. There were multiple <laughs> points this summer where I was like standing this close to it with bees zooming in and out and they just don't even care about you. So what kind of plant material do you have in there? That's a good question. So there are all different kinds, like each compartment is actually a different plant. So there's um, turtle head, elderberry. Um, lots of upright ornamental grasses have hollow stems, like panicum, uh, blue stem, probably miscanthus, uh, lots of allium. So all you gotta do is cut something and see. Right. <laughs> I'm constantly finding new ones every every yeah. spring because it's like, oh, that's hollow. I should save that. <laughs> so. And then we also built a wall. Um, so that I actually saw that in in. Um, in the Netherlands a few years back and took some pictures and you know they're popular uh, kind of all over now but it makes it more interesting to um, to have something like this and you know and give give the insects a home and all sorts of you know things can live in there different beetles and bugs and, and, and some of the bees and stuff that Katie talked about so you kind of just it was a solid wall Katie dismantled portions of it and Put it back with simple bricks and concrete blocks that are super cheap again to do. And uh, yeah, it's kind of fun. And then what we, we wanted to talk about spiders, I think, next, right? Yeah, if we could just relocate. I have a cool spider egg sack I want to show you guys. Okay, well, we relocated. We're now in the sunken garden, which is my territory. Um, and my favorite garden, of course. <laughs> Sorry, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk about the uh, spiders and their like kind of benefits to the garden. Um, I know a lot of people are really icked out by them. I personally really like them, especially the yellow and black garden spiders that we see a lot here. Um, they're actually a super great beneficial, not insect, beneficial spider. They um, eat a lot of the bad bugs that come flying through. Sometimes they do get a bee or a butterfly, but most of the time they get the, the bad stuff for us. Um, and I just wanted to point out one of the reasons that we talked about earlier about not cutting a lot of material back is because the, the way these insects overwinter is very sneaky. Like you can't really tell what they look like. So I do have an example of the spider egg sac right down here. So if you wanna zoom in close, it's right here. And you can see just how well it blends in. Like it looks very similar to the leaf right next to it. Um, and this one's, a, well for me it was fairly easy to find just because I know what it looks like. But a lot of times they're um, on like dried plant material that looks just like that. So you would never like actually see it before you start cutting stuff down. Um, so yeah, there's, there's another reason why we... So when would, when would the spiders come out of there? About? These ones typically come out kind of around that 50 degree mark again um, uh, in spring. Right. Um, about a thousand spiders live in this guy all winter. Um, I did read that they can hatch in here like now, this time of year, and then they'll emerge in the springtime and then you'll get these tiny little yellow spiders. Um, and they usually kind of do stick kind of local or they'll, they move by like the wind and the wind will kind of carry them off to other, other places. Oh, so. cool. And one of my favorite things is like if we get a heavy dew in, the, in summer, you can pick out literally hundreds mm -hmm. of the, the spider webs in the air. And that's what's so cool about these ones too, is like by the August, you notice them because they're huge, like they're the size of your thumb. But it's like how you miss them the entire summer, it like just kind of blows my mind. But yeah, they're really cool. They're such a cool, pretty spider too. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the yellow, the big yellow and black ones, those are the females. The male is a lot, um, not nearly as good looking. Uh, he's a lot smaller. He kind of like hangs out on a either he'll build his web inside of her web sometimes, or he'll hang out behind her web. Like just nothing that spectacular. And he'll actually come up to her web and hook it and let her know that he's ready to mate. And that's how she knows it's go time. <laughs> so cool. And every year I can usually find about eight to ten spiders in the sunken garden, so I can kind of keep tabs on where they are. So I knew there was one in this corner um, in the summer, so that's how I knew to kind of look for the mm -hmm. egg sac. And they can lay up to three to four egg sacs per spider. 
Oh my god. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And one thing I learned about is these spiders eat other bad insects. Yep. But I remember Doug Calvi saying that spiders are actually like a major food source for a lot of birds, yep. which I would never, you know, I guess they never thought that mm -hmm. they would get eaten. But I guess if there's 4,000 hatching just from that <laughs> one spot, that makes, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And these ones are very like docile, they're not aggressive at all. Like you may get bit if you're like pinching at it, but if you like bump <laughs> it, and I've walked into them several times, and they'll just like drop and go hide underneath the shrub. Like, not going to harm you at all. So. Yeah. Well, I mentioned Doug Calamy a second ago, and um, I'm happy to say we're going to have a virtual lecture series this winter, and Doug Calamy is one of uh, one of the people who will be speaking to us, as well as Heather Holmes, who is a pollinator and bee expert, so you'll learn way more about this than we were able to talk about today. And on November 18th will be our next um, uh, Facebook Live, uh, and that will be, uh, I think, Colton Blackburn, our conservatory curator, and others talking about um, taking care of your houseplants. So uh, tune in to that. Thanks.